It's a pleasure to be invited by Cardiac Risk and the Young to talk in this forum today. And I'm going to be speaking on exercising with aortic and mitral valve disease. So valvular heart disease is common in older adults, but may present in young and middle-aged individuals who are interested in participating in sporting activities. Congenital valvular heart disease, compatible with daily life activities, including sport, is in the range of 2 to 3%. So I'd like to start this lecture by posing some questions which an exercising individual may want answers to, and when going through the literature, there's very little evidence for. So let's start with question one. What are the possible effects of exercise on valve disease? The adrenergic surges and the increased hemodynamic load on the heart can have several consequences in individuals with valvular heart disease, which include the possibility of functional deterioration of valves due to higher heart rates and stroke volume, they may cause adverse cardiac remodelling. You may see myocardial ischemia due to high oxygen demands. They may precipitate arrhythmias. They may cause pulmonary hypertension due to chronic increases in left heart pressure. And those with bicuspid aortic valves, you may identify an exacerbation of aortopathy. So which types of valve diseases are considered safe for intensive exercise? Lesions considered safe and compatible with exercise include your mild stenotic and your mild regurgitant lesions. Your moderate regurgitant valvular lesions may also be compatible with exercise in the absence of hemodynamic disturbances in your heart rate and blood pressure response to exercise, the absence of any exercise-induced symptoms and arrhythmias, and it's important to ensure that the patient can tolerate the level of exertion expected for the specific type of activity they want to participate in. Individuals with severe valvular abnormalities should not participate in competitive sport. So your patient asks, how quickly do valves deteriorate with exercise? Good question. There's very little data on the progression of valvular disease with exercise. There is a theoretical opinion that uh, higher stroke volumes may cause a deleterious mechanical effects on the valves. Furthermore, there's very little information on influence of isometric exercises on the progression of ventricular dysfunction in such individuals, particularly when such activities are occasionally carried out. What are the symptoms of a deteriorating valve disease? Most individuals with valve, valvular abnormalities of a mild to moderate nature will remain asymptomatic and require a yearly to two yearly assessment. However, it's important to inform these exercising individuals of warning symptoms suggestive of deterioration, which includes symptoms of angina, breathlessness, palpitations, exertional dizziness, and syncope. And symptom onset may suggest deterioration of the valvular abnormality, adverse LV remodeling, and or LV dysfunction, which if left untreated, it potentially puts the individual at risk of ventricular arrhythmias and sudden death. I'd now like to focus on two valvular abnormalities, mitral valve prolapse and bicuspid aortic valves, which does require a bit more focus attention. So your patient says, I have mitral valve prolapse, should I be worried? Mitral valve prolapse is common, there is a genetic predisposition and the potential for progressive mitral regurgitation in 5 to 10% of individuals. Other complications include the risk of endocarditis, emboli, pulmonary hypertension, and arrhythmogenic sudden cardiac death, which is the most feared complication and probably why an athlete will be warned. In this study by the Padua group, they looked at the cardio cardiac pathology registry of 650 young adults and identified that mitral valve prolapse accounted for 7% of all sudden cardiac death. And these deaths were more common in females. In a study by Professor Pelicci's group, they looked at just under 7,500 young competitive athletes and identified that the prevalence of mitral valve prolapse was just under 3%. And over a follow-up of eight plus minus two years, there were no cases of sudden cardiac death. So in general, individuals with mitral valve prolapse of a mild to moderate regurgitant severity can participate in all competitive sport. But based on the two studies I've just shown you, there are certain markers that may signify an increased risk, which you need to be aware of and may need to assess for. And these include T-wave inversion on the 12 lead ECG, any arrhythmias, family history of sudden cardiac death, on imaging, we're looking for bileaflet mitral valve prolapse and mitral annular disjunction, severe mitral regurgitation, LV, LV systolic dysfunction, and on cardiac MRI, we're looking for midwall fibrosis in the basal infralateral wall and papillary muscles. I have bicuspid aortic valve disease. Should I be worried? Bicuspid aortic valve disease is a common congenital abnormality and affects 1 to 2% of the general population. 
amongst young competitive athletes. It's probably the second most common valvular abnormality identified at pre-participation screening after mitral valve prolapse. Asymptomatic bicuspid aortic valve disease patients have a good prognosis. Survival rates are no different from the general population. But there are some important complications you have to be aware of. Aortic stenosis causing mechanical obstruction, aortopathy with aortic root and ascending aortic dilatation, aortic dissection, and the unrecognized coarctation identified in 10% of patients with bicuspid aortic valves. And like mitral valve prolapse, there is a genetic predisposition, although a single gene mutation has yet to be identified. And around one third of families will have more than one affected individual. Around 50% of bicuspid aortic valve patients will have an associated aortopathy. Bicuspid aortic valve patients have an estimated five to nine times higher risk of developing an aortic dissection, although the absolute risk is low and estimated to be three per 10,000 patient years based on this study. So the question really is, does intensive exercise accelerate aortic dilatation in athletes with bicuspid aortic valves? In this, in this study by the St. George's group, they looked at 20 professional soccer players with bicuspid aortic valves and compared them with 20 non-athletes with bicuspid aortic valves and 22 healthy athletes with tricuspid aortic valves. They're all male. And they measured the aortic roots at the levels of the sinus of Valsalva at baseline and on follow-up of seven years with echocardiography. If we take a look at this table, after indexing for body surface area, the non-athletes with bicuspid aortic valves in your middle column had the largest aortic roots of the three groups, although the absolute aortic root dimensions were similar amongst the three groups. The athletes with bicuspid aortic valves demonstrated an index aortic root increment of 0.8 plus minus 0.3 millimetres per year over the follow-up period. However, there was no difference when comparing the trends of change within non-athletes with bicuspid aortic valves and athletes with tricuspid aortic valves. So the take-home message here is that exercise does not seem to be contributing to aortic root dilatation in young athletes with bicuspid aortic valves over this modest follow-up period. And similar studies have been published in the literature showing similar findings, but again, short or modest follow-up periods. So whilst we're waiting for long-term follow-up data, the general advice is in individuals who have an aortic root of more than 40 millimetres should be advised not to participate in sporting activities associated with increased loading conditions on the aorta, such as powerlifting and isometric exercises. So your patient asks, can I do leisure exercise? If so, how much? So individuals with valvular abnormalities should be encouraged to maintain the recommended physical activity levels. And the general advice is 20 minutes of daily exercise at a heart rate corresponding with the ventilatory anaerobic threshold it appears to be safe with those in card with cardiovascular abnormalities. And if this is not available, a reasonable surrogate would be 80% of your maximum predicted heart rate. And for those who are on beta blockers, 60 to 70% of their predicted heart rate. It's also important to encourage static muscle strengthening exercises to prevent sarcopenia and improve mitochondrial function. And the general advice is to use pulley systems for heavier weights, not exceeding 20% of the upper body weight and not exceeding 50% of the lower body weight. There are other factors we have to take into consideration in individuals with valvular abnormalities. These individuals may be at increased risk of atrial fibrillation, particularly your mitral valve diseases, and increased risk of thromboembolic events. Your standard risk scores, such as your CHADS VAS score, is not applicable, so where appropriate, anticoagulation should be commenced, and these individuals should be advised not to participate in contact or collision sports. These individuals are also at increased risk of infective endocarditis compared to the general population, and so we should be advising them on good dental hy hygiene, but also giving them advice to look out for non-specific features of endocarditis, such as fatigue and myalgia. They should be avoiding tattoos and body piercings. We should be surveying them every one to two years. And given the familial nature of bicuspid aortic valves and mitral valve prolapse, we should also be advising screening for first degree relatives. So in conclusion, there are concerns about valvular heart disease in relation to sport. 
Most individuals are asymptomatic, but symptom onset may suggest progression. Your minor valvular diseases are compatible with exercise. Your moderate valvular abnormalities can also be compatible with exercise, but we recommend doing an exercise test to ensure the hemodynamics are okay. And there are special precautions to take with your mitral valve prolapse, which we've discussed today, as we do, as we have with bicuspid aortic valves. And let's not forget to screen the first degree relatives. Thank you very much.